All right, everybody. Uh, cool. Welcome to the Kenan Longview series, Russia Resurrected, Its Power and Purpose in a New Global Order. My name is Michael Kimmich. I'm chair of the Kenan Institute Advisory Council and a professor at uh, Catholic University. Uh, and it's delight, uh, a delight of mine to, to, to sort of launch uh, the second of the Longview series uh, conversations that we're having, which is an effort to take a step back from the headlines and to foreground um, you know, excellent new research on the subject of Russia, US-Russian relations, uh, and the sort of post-Soviet uh, space more broadly. Um, please keep a lookout, uh, those who are attending this event, for a similar conversation with Professor Timothy Fry um, next, uh, next month in December uh, of his uh, new book, A Weak Strongman. Uh, and then we're also formulating a spring program we've, uh, with Professor Stoner, who I'll introduce in just a moment. We've gone by coastal and I think we're gonna to aspire to go international with the, uh, with the spring program and bring in some voices from uh, overseas. Uh, just to forewarn our audience in terms of, uh, you know, sort of protocol, um, if you have a question and we very much hope that you do, we really want you to jump in and, uh, and participate, please send it via email uh, to Kenan at wilsoncenter.org uh, or via Twitter, hashtag Kenan Institute, uh, or you can use the Facebook page and please do include your name and affiliation uh, with when you send in uh, your questions. I'll repeat this announcement. Um, uh, I'll repeat this announcement before we go to the uh, discussion section of this, uh, of this conversation. Well, it's an honor and a, and a pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, author and presenter, Professor Catherine Stoner. Uh, who's the Mossbacher Director of the Center on Democracy and Development and the Rule of Law, Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spoldy Institute for International Studies and Professor of Political Science and Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. These are all uh, affiliations under the umbrella of Stanford University. Prior to coming to Stanford, Professor uh, Stoner was on the faculty of Princeton University for several years. Um, and jointly in the Department of Politics and the Princeton School of International and Public Affairs, which I believe when Professor Stoner there, was there was known as the Woodrow Wilson uh, School. At Princeton, Professor Stoner received the Ralph O. Glendinning Preceptorship Award uh, for Outstanding Junior Faculty, has also served as visiting faculty at Columbia uh, and McGill and has, had, had, has had held a fellowship at Harvard University, but more importantly, I might say, uh, has had a, held a fellowship at the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Professor Stoner is the author of many, many academic articles uh, and uh, the author and co-author uh, of multiple books, among which are Transitions to Democracy, A Comparative Perspective, written and edited uh, with Mike McFall, and Autocracy and Democracy in the Post-Communist World, co-edited with Valerie Bunce uh, and Mike McFall as well. Um, I'll add, um, again, in, in, in listing these accolades, is a very important one that Professor Stoner is uh, an alum of the Kennan Institute's Research Scholar uh, Program. So it's, it's wonderful to see somebody with a direct affiliation both, both with the Wilson Center and the Kennan Institute uh, coming to speak before us today. And the book that she's going to uh, discuss, uh, and then we'll sort of go back and forth a little bit, and then we'll have a larger discussion of is uh, a truly wonderful contribution uh, to debates, discussions, and scholarly work uh, on post-Soviet Russia. Its title is Russia Resurrected, Its Power and Purpose in a New Global Order. And the book came out this past spring, spring of 2021, uh, with Oxford University Press. Uh, Professor Stoner, it's wonderful to have you with us. The, the floor is now yours, and uh, uh, we very much look forward to hearing you sort of introduce the major themes of the book. Sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michael. And it's such a pleasure to uh, to be with you, um, and um, and to to see folks um, from the Kennan Institute. I had a wonderful summer there a long time ago, <laughs> and uh, I always enjoy coming back. And um, I only regret in what is this morning to me out here on the West Coast is is that I'm actually not physically there um, with you all. But um, thanks so much for having me. I'm going to just um, introduce some of the themes of the book by, by uh, sharing my screen. So here I go. I'm always, it's always a moment of trepidation as this happens, but there, you should be able to see it and I will look for signals indicating that you can. Um, all right. So um, 
Right. As uh, Michael said, um, this this is the title of the book, Russia Resurrected. And you'll notice as I'm showing you the um, the uh, dust cover, dust jacket, um, which I obviously did not design, but I think it's kind of cool, um, is uh, does not have a question mark at the end of it. Um, but here on my slide on this side, it does have a question mark, Russia Resurrected. Um, and one of the reasons I start my, my talk here with a question mark is because it was a question in my mind. I actually didn't think of Russia as, a, as a, um, you know, a particularly great influence in the world or a great power that is when I started the book, which was about 2013 um, and or started this project. Um, and um, things changed. Um, and so when I <laughs> submitted the manuscript, um, to Oxford University Press, my editor, my, uh, David McBride said, um, we're taking out the question mark. It's no question anymore. And, and you know, you, you, the, the theme of the book is to try to demonstrate how uh, Russia's power resources are slightly uh, uh, greater than has been understood, at least in uh, some American foreign policy circles. So um, the genesis of the book is, is uh, really um, a seminar out here at the Center on International Security and Cooperation or CSAC, some folks may know it, it's been around since the Vietnam War, um, where we had a member of um, the uh, intelligence community, American intelligence community, come and say that essentially Russia was at the quote, little table uh, in terms of power with North Korea, this was 2012 and that um, it wanted to be at the big table thinking of a Thanksgiving dinner, but it was like a little, it's at the little table with, with, the, um, with the kids. Um, and so its power was really aspirational or its influence in the world was really aspirational, but not actualized. And the problem is China, it's not Russia. Well, um, so almost as though Vladimir Putin was listening in, um, it, it, there, there were some demonstrations of, of Russian influence, of course, that come up after that time, uh, including most notably the seizure uh, of the Crimean Peninsula in, in uh, uh, 2014. So there are different perceptions of Russian power. Here's uh, Putin's um, in 2002 and, and again in, in 2008, and then rather infamously in 2018, noting that in just 30 years, we in Russia have undergone changes that have taken centuries in other countries talking about Russia's developmental path. So these are presumably, these are, these are hyperbolic, but, um, but uh, they conflict uh, most notably with these sorts of perspectives here on the left side of the screen. Russia's not a pure power, right? It's at the little table, as I mentioned. Um, uh, it's a gas station with nukes, um, a country mask, a gas station masquerading as a country and then quite hurtful, I think, to Mr. Putin was Barack Obama's 2014 statement that he thought was provocative, that Russia is a regional power that threatens its neighbors out of weakness, not out of strength. Contrasted with this, and curiously, at the same time as, as these sorts of things are being said by politicians, um, some of our uh, military leaders are saying something quite different, um, that Russia's rewriting the Cold War settlement using force. And this is uh, by Phil Breedlove, who was out here at Stanford when he said this in uh, 2015. The Russians at the time, he told me we're calling him breed hate. Um, uh, Dunford, Selva, Adierno, Russia's an existential threat to the United States and various themes on that statement. And then President Biden uh, a year ago noting that um, in terms of threats to American security, um, Russia is is the biggest um, the biggest competitor is China. So some disagreement about whether Russia is strong or weak, whether its uh, actions in the international system now uh, are out of strength or out of weakness. So a lot of this depends on what you see uh, as strength or weakness, which is the bulk of of the book is is trying to define or redefine power. Um, but some of the things that Russia has done, and I don't think I need to explain to go through this um, with this audience, um, uh, and these are all government actions, not you know private um, uh, hackers down here at the bottom. Um, but even uh, right up to you know uh, a month or two ago with the hacking of Microsoft accounts that we've just uh, learned about, or Microsoft software and accounts uh, that we've just learned about in the last few weeks. Um, financing, um, Marine Le Pen, for example, uh, right-wing populist in France, buzzing U.S. warships. Um, so, 
um, these these are the kinds of things Russia has done to uh, to you know assert itself globally. But the book, of course, goes through many more examples of of, of this. So why, I was intrigued by this question. You know, why is there uh, so much disagreement on uh, whether Russia is strong or 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 weak? And um, one of the things I try to do, as I said, is, is think about different measures of power uh, or influence in international relations and um, try to blow up this sort of metaphor of Russia punching above its weight um, or uh, Russia having um, uh, you know, uh, a weak hand and somehow Mr. Putin as a, a you know, evil genius uses the cards uh, that he has well. Um, and so what I try to do in the book is offer two direct correctives on how we think about power in international relations and that we're looking first uh, or thinking about it too narrowly. Um, and so we look overlook um, capabilities, right? So we need to look beyond traditional measures of men, military and money, which by the way, the book also looks at um, um, and um, uh, try to capture things that uh, a measure, for example, of gross domestic product wouldn't show you, which is control over, for example, oil or gas pipelines. And so right now we're seeing right natural gas prices in Western Europe uh, just shooting up through the through the roof. Um, Russia obviously has the capability to produce more uh, oil or, or gas in particular, natural gas, and send it into Western Europe um, and is not doing that. Um, and uh, so the, the thought is that, that until Nord Stream 2 is approved, uh, Mr. Putin is, is holding back on that or, or Russia is holding back on that. So I try to look beyond traditional measures of men, military and money. You wouldn't necessarily get the exercise of influence uh, in, in, uh, that I just described to you in, in terms of natural gas uh, um, supplies and control over pipelines and, and uh, uh, if you just looked at GDP. Um, so. Um, I point out also that power is multidimensional, that it's relative and contextual. So it really depends to some degree on what game you're playing in international politics um, uh, to know what tool is going to be powerful or effective. And, and I liken it to uh, a card game, right? A, a good hand at bridge, a uh, hand of cards at bridge is a bad one at poker. Um, that. And then finally, I note that a country's power tools can be good enough to be very disruptive depending on um, the context. You don't have to have the most of everything as we see, I think, in the way Russia has behaved in the last six or seven years um, to be extraordinarily disruptive. And then the second corrective is the characterization of Russia as weak uh, is outdated. Um, that Russia has actually recovered or maintained some of its prior capacities more than is commonly appreciated. One of those is of course nuclear, that it has some new tools uh, in international power that aren't that expensive, but very disruptive. And, and here, you know, this, is, this would be uh, what the book calls in a chapter sharp power um, or um, cyber-based um, tools. And then finally, um, that Russia's domestic politics matter currently in, in how um, Mr. Putin's regime exercises uh, influence globally. And that there, the, the lack of institutional checks enable a very powerful uh, president to use Russian power tools quickly and without much accountability, at least for now. And that there's a pretty high risk tolerance uh, in the current regime um, as well. And I note that this is quite different from, um, from even the Soviet system where there was after all a, a check uh, in, uh, on the general secretary as Khrushchev was well aware. Uh, and, uh, and Gorbachev of course had a Politburo that, that crewed against him. So um, this is how I redefine power or try to look beyond just means, the traditional means of men, military and money and think about power over whom to do what you don't bring a knife to a gunfight, right? And then looking at geographic domain, where and how many countries uh, does Russia exercise power and looking at how it has become increasingly a global power. And then how important uh, in certain policy areas uh, is, is Russia and how many policy areas uh, does it matter in? And, and those are in particular uh, natural resource export uh, areas. Um, but there are others uh, as well as the book notes um, in, in terms of uh, aluminum markets, 
um, and uh, even now green. So this is the basic uh, argument, Michael, and I guess I should stop there, right? Um, that um, that Russia is, is uh, as my editor would say, it is resurrected, take off this question mark. Um, and it has enough power beyond those traditional means of power alone um, to be disruptive and sometimes decisive in international politics. And my, my reason uh, for why uh, this has happened is because also this particular regime under Vladimir Putin has the will to use what Russia has largely unconstrained now by society. Um, and that domestic politics drives Russian foreign policy as much or more uh, than structural interests alone. So this is not just a great power, as John Mearsheimer has said, doing what great powers do. And I argue against Russia responding to uh, in its in more recent foreign policy choices, uh, as, as in the annexation of Crimea, not just responding to uh, provocative actions by, uh, of NATO expansion, which after all hadn't expanded uh, in 2014 since 2009, um, that um, there is the regime type matters in determining foreign policy decisions and the deployment of power resources. And there's something about Putinism uh, in terms of the way Russia exercises the power tools um, that it has. And I suppose the sort of provocative, hopefully provocative or, uh, ending of the book is, you know, um, imagine a Russia that is not under Vladimir Putin and someday we will have that. And if it was uh, more uh, uh, open um, to um, uh, or, uh, liberal or Western um, perspectives, and we've had such a, um, and more cooperative, um, that you could imagine it uh, using its, uh, its power uh, resources abroad in a, in a very different way. Um, and so I, I say this is not inevitable in the book that Russia behaves this way, um, but that it is because of this form of patronal autocracy that has matured over Mr. Putin's now uh, 20 years in office that has made it behave this way uh, at this time in the international system. So how about I stop there, Michael? Would that be okay? And, and um, Sure. Okay, stop my share there. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful overview of this uh, book. Let me just repeat the uh, instruction about asking questions, although I'm gonna ask three of my own, but uh, while I am, the audience can certainly start jumping in uh, either by email, Kenan at wilsoncenter.org, Twitter, hashtag Kenan Institute, uh, or via uh, Facebook. And then we'll, uh, you know, just sort of present the questions to, uh, to our speaker, but I want to uh, ask uh, sort of three questions in turn that your book uh, and presentation inspired. Uh, and the first is, is, is to say that I find your book so persuasive. You know, it has the quality of, of, of being, I know it isn't this way when you research and write the book, but it has the quality when you read it of being self-evident. It really feels like the argument unfolds so naturally that it did make me wonder why you could say the alternative paradigm, the sort of declinist paradigm is as entrenched as it is, especially in policy circles uh, in Washington, DC. Obviously it's a question that's much debated in Washington. There are different points of view. I wouldn't want to suggest that the declinist paradigm uh, is the only paradigm or, or perhaps even the, uh, the dominant one, but it's certainly a, a significant one uh, in, in policy circles. And then in the public sphere, I think there's also this sense that um, you know, Russia is a, is, is a declining power. And then you had all of those quotes from McCain and, and Obama and others that, that reinforced that narrative. So I'm curious to ask you why you think that there is such a, a belief, you know, sort of not a question about Russia really, it's more a question about us or a question, a question about the West. Why, why that's so prominent and, uh, you know, sort of how that's become so widely uh, distributed. It's not the argument of your book, but I, I imagine that it's sort of figured in the, in the, in the creation of your argument. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can't, I, I think that perspectives have, have changed or starting to change um, when, you know, in response to the electoral interference of 2016 and then um, um, some, you know, other events that I listed there that have, that have happened since. Um, uh, I, I do think that there is, um, 
you know, when you when you go out, and you probably know this, Michael, when you talk you give talks about uh, about Russia in general to the general public, you you get questions as though the Soviet Union is still existing. And we're now, you know, this December 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I think that there is a there's a generational issue um, there in terms of how people have uh, have it fixed in their minds. And then I do think that there are some you know, powerful. So talk first about the public perception uh, and then and then uh, within policy circles. So public perception, I think then there are, you have other, you know, people who have a, um, a really uh, a loud microphone, like, you know, the Rachel Maddows of the world who write this, you know, she wrote her book about, I don't know, but oil or something um, and did this very, you know, quick and dirty sort of caricature perception of royal of Russia as a as an oil state and, and classically oil cursed state. And obviously oil export revenues are tremendously important to the Russian economy. They were to the Soviet economy as well. Um, but you know uh, some some folks think that, that that the decline in oil prices in the in um, the mid 80s is is why the Soviet Union or one reason why the Soviet Union fell. Um, so you know that the relationship of oil to the economy is is not a new one, um, and um, and I think that it's that's an easy way to understand Russia and why it's an autocracy. It just doesn't happen to be right, um, right, um, and it doesn't doesn't have to be inevitable. Uh, it is an aspect of, of Russian politics and political economy, but it's not the only one. It's important, but it's not the only one. Um, so I think that's partly it. You know, people look for easy filters to understand complex situations, and that's an easy one. Um, um, and then there is a belief that, well, this won't go on forever. Uh, so there's a time horizons issue, right? Um, you know, eventually we'll all drive electric cars. Um, I, I just got one, but I, you know, I'm out here in Palo Alto. Everyone has one, and, and we're a bubble. I and mean, we sometimes we know that, not always, but <laughs> sometimes we know that. Um, you know, I think it's maybe 3% of the American market is driving electric cars. So uh, it, it, how long is a long time or forever, right? Uh, obviously, it, uh, yes, right. There will be technological change, but if your time horizon is four years or, or two years, we're not all going to drive electric cars then. And so that makes oil and natural, you know, natural gas still uh, very important and valuable commodities. And so when you're making policy, um, and, and looking at, you know, things Russia has, that's, that's a big area of influence, but it's not just even selling and getting the revenue, it's controlling pipelines. And so, you know, some of what Russia has accomplished or acquired in the Syria um, uh, operation is control over really important pipelines in Northern Syria that come from other countries, oil exporting countries in the Middle East. Um, and uh, um, controlling a, a port now on the Mediterranean, Tartus, um, making it bigger, and they'll be in there for a really long time. So this has now given them, um, you know, a pretty permanent presence in an important part of the Middle East. Uh, so I think we're not looking at things like that. Instead, people focus on GDP and their GDP versus our GDP. That doesn't actually really tell you very much um, about about development. It doesn't tell you about things like, yeah, but they got this TARDIS thing. They, um, um, and then I think there's a bit of an, un, Russia's economy is not, you know, it's, it, it's not on the ropes. We, that's in a sense, wishful thinking. Um, and that, you know, um, there are, there is a big country called China uh, that we've focused a lot of attention on. And, and Russia has, uh, in the last couple of years, worked pretty hard to um, to develop its uh, its relationship with China, that's in the in the book as well, uh, among other places, India into the Middle East. Um, so I think it's not looking sort of at the fine grained um, things that may give Russia more influence uh, globally than is commonly uh, uh, thought of um, when we're looking at means of power. But some of those means are pretty good too. I'm, I'm touched on the military. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, there's, uh, you know, we could return to this topic perhaps a little bit later if there's time. I think a kind of chronic underestimation of Russia uh, in policymaking, that's not a scholarly question, that's a, a question of sort of assessments. And I think U.S. was quite surprised by Crimea, was again surprised in Syria, was surprised in 2016 with the election meddling. And that points to something that's analytically sort of not quite right with our um, policymaking imagination. I think it follows from a lot of the 
the themes that you're describing. I want to jump in, although the questions are starting to pile up in a very nice way. I want to jump in with a second question. Maybe I'll hold off on my third uh, on this uh, and, and simply see if there's there's time for it later on. But I do want to ask a, a sort of second question. It comes from the title of your book. So Russia, its power and purpose. And I wanted to disentangle those two things from your title. So power is one thing, purpose uh, is another. And sort of the first three sections of your book, you lay out, again, very, very convincingly, uh, the sources of Russian power, which are to a degree uh, military uh, and stem not just from access to resources and their value on the market, but also macroeconomic stability, uh, which is not to be taken for granted in any country and a sort of a, a particular achievement of the uh, of the Putin regime, you know, highly educated population, um, you know, sort of some of those factors and the ability to project power of different kinds of form, sharp, uh, soft, uh, and hard, um, most, uh, uh, you know, sort of convincingly on Russia's borders, but also uh, quite far away uh, as well. So you have all of that, that's the Russia resurrected, but your conclusion takes the reader in a somewhat different uh, direction. You indicated something of this, uh, in your, in your presentation that regime type is important uh, and you emphasize the non-inevitable nature of the regime type. I wanna ask a sort of crude question in a certain way. If Putin has resurrected Russia, what's not to like, I mean, for Russians, what's not to like about Putin? Why would they consider a different re regime, regime type? Uh, and perhaps here you could sort of reflect a bit on the conclusion of the, uh, of the mm -hmm. book and how it offers a, a multifaceted view of the of sort of possible Russian futures. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. So, so great question. And uh, you mentioned that you have Tim Fry coming to talk about his book, Weak Strong Man. Um, he's actually, we're doing a, an event here next week, and then we're doing another uh, together, and then we're doing another event together. And I noticed he just wrote a review of my book, and I'm in the middle of writing a review of his. So I will, <laughs> I will, I will quote him, but not steal uh, his thunder from his, his very excellent book uh, on on Putin and some of the constraints on, on Putin. Um, so, um, you know, both things can be right. And uh, one of the things that, that Tim points out in, in his book, and it's from an article that he and he wrote with some colleagues on how genuine is support for Putin uh, among the Russian people. And um, among a certain population of uh, Russians, it is genuine. Uh, right, and so he's he's gone and done some experiments that I will let him explain. Um, but um, it, it isn't, you know, what what you see in terms of manipulation of, of votes, perhaps for uh, no, perhaps, but for United Russia in September, um, you know, Putin would probably win the next uh, presidential election relatively easily. Um, were he running right now, um, uh, because you know, first there, there isn't an alternative, right? The opposition is pretty much kept out of, out of um, the limelight um, and view, and sometimes put in prison or uh, um, arrested or simply not allowed to register. Um, and then you know, uh, Russians are bombarded with success, success, success. Uh, of um, you know, literally when they started the campaign in Syria, you may have seen on Russian television. Even the weather was referring to, you know, what 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 it looks like for the boys flying over Syria and, and bombing. Um, so, um, you know, the use of use of media as well, having no alternative, and then appearing with his shirt off and looking vigorous, and um, and then you know, people have seen uh, a material change in their lives that has, for many, not all, been positive. It hasn't been consistent, right? It's gone up and down. That's true of all countries um they they you know had a lot of trouble during covid so if we they haven't you know uh, people are not uh, so this is all the good side right this is why people might support him but the book goes in a bit of a different direction and says but here's the thing this is this is pretty fragile um and public opinion does tend to be fickle um over time and so and so you know you can manipulate it for a while but um now, you know, the, the value of people's savings or wages is, is uh, declining. There's, you know, complaints about corruption. We saw young people come out on the um, streets in, in the spring of 2017, very actively uh, uh, protesting against corruption um, that, you know, Navalny has sh showed at that time for, the, for those particular sets of protests that was about you know, Medvedev and, and his, his dacha. 
Um, and so what are you seeing now um, is uh, getting rid of people like Navalny uh, in the public sphere so that there is no threat to the regime. A secure regime doesn't need to, you know, toss people as, you know, as, as significant as Navalny is to us here in, in the West and in Russia watchers. He was not a particularly significant player in Russian politics, right? He, he was, you know, not, not a name that surprising to us was particularly well known until he was arrested <laughs> or poisoned and arrested, right? So that's not really great leadership. And that's not, um, you know, throwing him in jail and, and then his show, you know, it just brought actually even perhaps more attention to um, the video that he did of, of Putin's palace. So, um, you know, this in many ways, uh, despite some developmental successes, which I document, um, one of the reasons that that Russia has become in you know, Russian foreign policy under Putin, and I'm, I note since 2012 in particular, has become more aggressive um, in, in using those tools. Um, so turning really from the cooperation of, of 2008 to 2012 and even 2000 to 2006 when Putin was president alone and not prime minister with Medvedev as president. Um, this is why I think that some of the uh, concerns at home um, is why the narrative, I argue, in, uh, uh, in domestic politics is Russia is under siege. Um, the liberal permissive West is out to get us. And so, you know, grabbing Crimea and Ukraine is, is, was not, I think it was impulsive. Um, and, but it was it woven into this sort of nationalist uh, rhetoric and militarism of Russian society. We must protect ourselves. And it's again, I think, the, as I say, the big worry is uh, not to say that Russia does not have structural interests and it has had those historically over time, all countries do, but the worry for this regime and the way it, it behaves is really one of domestic politics. And so one of the things Ms. I open I, the last chapter with is a quote from Putin. I have it have it here, uh, but I'll go, I'll go with it from Putin. That's something like, you know, we need evolutionary change in Russia, not revolutionary. Russia has over fulfilled the plan uh, in terms of revolution. So that so the, what we need is stability. So there's an interest in domestic stability. Uh, so uh, to keep that, you know, uh, crack down on the opposition, keep them out of politics um, to the extent possible. And we see that every day in Russia uh, these days. Um, and then also, you know, look for enemies abroad. Um, and, uh, and so that is also, I think, part of, you know, what partly has driven foreign policy. Wonderful. We now have a, a, a fairly long list of questions. So we're going to turn to our audience questions, which I'll uh, sort of ask uh, on the basis of, of, of written questions. The first comes from Sir John Scarlett, who's uh, among many other titles, co-chair of uh, the Wilson Center's Global Advisory Council. Uh, and his question is, um, you referred to the events of 30 years ago, how much is Putin's assertive, even ruthless international policy motivated by the need to push back against the humiliation uh, of the collapse? So, um, you know, some view it as a humiliation, some view it as, uh, as uh, sort of a, a good thing. I think actually that Putin views some aspects of it as a, as a good thing, despite the the quote that is often uh, you know uh, brought up uh, where where he said you know it was the biggest uh, you know tragedy of the 20th century. Um, but the rest of that quote, and I say this in in the book as well, goes on to say you know but it wasn't a good system. Um, so he's he's not necessarily a communist. He's a, he's a dictator. Uh, he's an authoritarian. <laughs> so, uh, but not not a communist one per se. Um, you know the the cronyism that uh, in the patronal authoritarian system that he runs allows him to control a state and distribute state assets basically to a you know a coterie of of elites who like to keep him uh, in office and and enrich themselves. And so. As long as that money keeps flowing, then you know I think this is fine for for him. In terms of the, I think the collapse was a shock, um, and um, there, there's certainly within Russian society there's nostalgia for aspects of, of the Soviet Union, but you know, there's also generational change, um, and we now have you know people who are in their 30s who have no memory of the Soviet system, 
um, and instead have a, a memory, you know, have a, a real life lived experience now of using their cell phones and using the internet and, um, you know, trying to uh, be entrepreneurs. And um, these are people that Putin has nothing in, in common with. And so uh, now the Second World War, that resonates still with all of Russia. Um, I, that is, you know, something that matters across generations. Um, but um, I, I, I don't think that there's an empire strikes back aspect to this. Um, there are some folks, and I mentioned this in the final chapter of the book, who, you know, make this Weimar Russia argument. And I'm happy to talk more about that. But that that's, uh, I think, a sort of silly a- analogy. No, no settlement was imposed on Russia at the end of the Cold War, like the Versailles Treaty. Um, and, um, uh, you know, those, uh, Russia is not, is not a big debtor internationally anymore. Um, and so, um, you know, when you think about who lost Russia in the 1990s, I, I think it was Russian decision makers who lost Russia ultimately in the 1990s. Anyway, happy to talk much more about that. Obviously, I have a lot of opinions. Yeah. <laughs> so our, our second question from the audience comes from Christopher Bort, who's a visiting scholar at uh, the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, and his question is about... Um, you're saying that Putin has the will to use his power tools um, and also that his tolerance for risk is high. The question is, did he always, did Putin always have that will and that risk for risk, sort of tolerance risk, uh, or did he, did he develop it? And if so, how, why, and when did he develop it? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and I, I think that it, 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 you know, what I argue in the book is that it's evolved. So, you know, the Vladimir Putin, who, who becomes acting president in 2000, um, uh, as Yeltsin, you know, by surprise steps down, is, is not the person we're dealing with in 2021. Um, uh, obviously, you know, the experience of governing um, changes anybody in terms of, you look at Anna Hall Merkel, started out quite differently as well. And, and so um, I, I think that um, the experience of governing and then the system, and is the argument that I make in the in the last chapter, the system that has developed of, of basically using state assets for personal self enrichment um, has matured, and so um, I, and and his preeminence in that system obviously has matured as well. Now there are there is evidence in a, in, in a lot of other you know books uh, like Putin's people and and whatnot, and I, and I go through some of this story, but not very much. Um, of the way that uh, that Putin behaved in St. Petersburg when he was um, deputy mayor for foreign relations and and how his you know uh, coterie of friends who are still who are fabulously wealthy now as as um, as the the uh, the question implies I think um, are uh, were benefiting um, from you know uh, his position. Um, and able to create schemes, uh, schemes where they were able to basically steal um, from the state and then, and then buy this uh, um, dachas outside of St. Petersburg. So, um, so elements perhaps were there, um, but I think the, con- the, um, there was a change when he came back uh, in to the presidency in 2012 um, that, that, is, that was partly based on the system that had, uh, and that Medvedev was, not capable of maintaining this um, system as well. Wonderful. Let's move on to another question from, uh, from, from the audience. This, and please excuse me if I mispronounced your last name, Carol uh, Seibetz, a senior advisor at the Security Studies Program at uh, MIT. Uh, and you've already said a little bit about this question. It's nice to hear well, of course, be nice to hear uh, sort of for your further thinking about it. And this is how would you conceptualize or how do you conceptualize the relationship between Russia's domestic and foreign policies? And then there's a sort of hypothetical second part to the question. Uh, if you would remove Putin from the equation, <laughs> would Russia be as uh, as resurgent? So I think that's sort of the million dollar question of your book. So mm-hmm. it's nice to hear it posed so, so cogently. Mm-hmm. So hi, Carol. Good to, good to know you're out there. Um, so yes, yeah, so I actually, I, I do ca- uh, pose that counterfactual in the, in the final um, chapter uh, of the book. Um, and, um, you know, it, obviously the big, 
the, the answer is it, it depends on who replaces him and the circumstances under which Putin would leave office. So um, uh, if, if he were to leave as many uh, autocrats do, think of Saddam Hussein, right? Or, or Gaddafi, uh, in, where he's you know, under siege and people are on the, on the streets and there's more or less a, a revolution uh, or uprising. I think this is very unlikely um, in, in Russia today, uh, especially under COVID conditions or whatnot. Um, then, you know, and he's essentially pulled out of a hole and put on trial, that's one thing, right? And that, that implies perhaps a, uh, you know, liberalization and a replacement to, with a democratic government. That, that, um, that, in that scenario, if he were replaced, you know, my argument is by someone who uh, is, has a sort of more, um, uh, well, who is not part of this system, frankly, of, of uh, patronal authoritarianism, and who's you know elected uh, in free and fair uh, in a free and fair process, um, then we may see yes a, a different foreign policy. So my argument is that uh, Russia has sure like any country some structural interests, but that's not the only thing that determines Russian foreign policy. So just as we see you know differences between Biden and Trump, we would see differences between. Uh, Putin and someone with a with a sort of you know uh, more uh, open um, perspective on, on the world and understanding um, that you know as well as Russia has done developmentally it's it could have done much better right it's still not exactly that you know it's like a its economy is like a Spain um, on a good day um, but uh, in terms of GDP so imagine uh, if we had a different leader in Russia who hadn't grabbed. Uh, Crimea and the Russian economy wasn't under sanctions. Um, well, that would be better, uh, much better. Um, and there is, you know, a uh, there is a, a possibility of a future like that uh, without sanctions. So, although they haven't, the sanctions haven't killed the Russian economy, they haven't been helpful um, either. So, I think that's the the sort of thing is to 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 um, that's one scenario, right? Um, imagine if um, you know uh, there are there are officials in Russia, and then there are. There are academics here who have eaten up this this sort of Weimar Russia perspective. Imagine, uh, okay, if um, if it truly were, you know, they had gone through something like this, the Second World War in in terms of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and we were starting uh, afresh. Well, Germany is a consolidated democracy, uh, and it's got a thriving market economy. Uh, imagine Russia having taken truly taken that uh, path, right? So this is not inevitable. And, uh, you know, I think in a sense, the Russian economy has recovered despite uh, what, you know, Putin's uh, foreign policy actions. And frankly, part of the reason that um, they have become, uh, again, a, a powerful influential presence in the Middle East is because of economic concerns, uh, right? So look at the leverage that has been gained over those pipelines, over, uh, the movement of, of oil uh, in particular. Um, so I'll stop there. Our next question also comes from uh, the, the, the Boston area, or, or even more precisely from, from Cambridge. This is from Thomas F. Remington, a visiting professor of government oh. at Harvard. Hey, Tom. Uh, <laughs> a known entity. Uh, and the question is, how do you think the U.S could establish something like normal in quotation marks, long-term mm -hmm. uh, relations with Russia, uh, combining the conflictual elements with cooperative elements, will this have to wait until Putin is gone? Well, first, great to know you're out there too, Tom. Um, and great question, obviously. Um, I should ask you that, <laughs> that question. So I have ideas. So, you know, I think it's baby steps at, at this point. Um, you know, I think we've been surprised that that well, some are surprised that that you know the Europeans have stuck with us on sanctions as long as they have. Um, I, I you know I don't think there's any will to use military force to try to get uh, Russia out of uh, Crimea, and um, but and there's unfortunately not a lot of I think um, European interest in trying to settle um, the the Crimean issue and there's a sort of recognition and I, I mean a, a study group and was in a um, 
with some, some European scholars and policymakers. Um, and in a, um, a conversation with some of them, you know, it's, it's uh, um, a, a, another conversation with someone who, who had recently been talking to Macron, who has this idea that we must now kind of engage with Russia more. And so as Merkel leaves office, um, he, he will attempt to do this. Uh, according to the, the person that I was speaking with, you know, uh, Putin and Merkel have met 80 times uh, over Crimea. 80 times and um, she has obviously made no progress and she speaks Russian and he speaks German, you know, there, there's a long, not necessarily close personal relationship, but there's a long relationship there and she made no progress. So I'm not sure that Macron is going to, well, I'm pretty sure he's not going to make any progress. So what, so what is left for us? Well, we have to deal with Putin. We're stuck with him, um, you know, uh, until uh, at least 2024. But uh, as you well know, uh, he can stay till till uh, 2036 if he wants to. Um, and he's purposely keeping everyone internally and externally off balance as to whether or not he'll do that. He just turned 69 um, a few weeks ago, um, but he appears to be hale and hearty, although there's some questions, I suppose, about that as well. Parkinson's is the rumor that goes around from time to time. Um, uh, in terms of dealing with him now, I think the Biden administration is doing what's possible, but they have this fix, fix, in term, uh, you know, uh, Victoria Newland went over, John Kerry's gone over to talk about the environment. Um, first of all, there's not a, this idea that we can somehow break Russia away from China. I think is ludicrous. That's just, why would Putin do that um, when we have him under sanction and we've sort of proven ourselves not always globally to be the most reliable partner, right? Um, not that China is necessarily, but for now, um, for a guy whose time horizons are probably not much before be, beyond two or three years from now, China looks pretty good. Um, and, and China needs energy, Russia can send it, um, and technology. And China's interested, as Russia is, in, in opening up this northern trade route uh, uh, through the Arctic. Um, and so there are lots of things they can work together on. Um, and same with India. These are you know, big markets that Russia has, has become very present and interested in. The other thing is, uh, so, so I think that's folly. Um, the other idea that, that the Biden administration seems to have is, you know, let's just calm Russia down. Well, we've turned and focus on China. That's just not going to happen. You, you, you have to deal with them. I mean, that that gives Putin opportunity and more leverage by you know sending that message. So I think trying to reestablish uh, uh, basic relations in the way that they haven't uh, is is a good start. But these other things are are pipe dreams. But the um, sending Newland over at least having conversations on things like climate, uh, which Putin has suddenly gotten religion on, um, in on having conversations even about, you know, uh, the situation with our embassies is, is dire. Uh, the, uh, you know, there was a former ambassador and probably not the one you're thinking of on a call I was with rec uh, on recently, a more recent ambassador than the one you're probably thinking of, Mike McCall, who's my colleague here down the hall. Um, uh, John Tepp, you know, folks were saying that the consular services at the U.S. embassy in Moscow are so diminished currently because of limits that have been put on uh, by the Russians um, that it, it, they're telling people if you want to get a visa from Russia to come to the United States, go to Poland. Um, so, you know, this is highly problematic. And I think person to person exchanges have actually been very uh, effective in exposing young Americans, young Russians to our societies and realizing what's similar and, and what's different and that we're, we're not as bad as uh, we're all painted out to be. And there's also real interest in, in young Russians in, um, in going abroad and traveling and, and that includes the United States. So I think that's one thing that we have to, you know, that's an, that should be an, an, a relatively easy thing to get together and, and solve. And certainly the Russians have an interest in doing that too, because they're in a not dissimilar situation here in the U.S. So that would be one place to start and then get those exchanges going again and, and um, try and, and um, re-normalize the relationship that way. But it's going to be a long haul as long as Putin is there. 
Well, we have three further questions in about 10 minutes of time. So what I'm gonna do is ask one question and then I'll sort of ask the final two questions and then that can be an occasion for, um, for you, Catherine, to offer some closing comments as well. Uh, and the final two questions are both uh, sort of fairly large in scope and, the, and, and this one before us is a little bit more specific. This is from Alex Quirky who's a program officer at, at Cultural Vistas and asks about uh, climate change. Uh, you just mentioned John Kerry uh, and his meetings with the Russian government. Uh, and this question uh, focuses on uh, migration that might be generated by climate change, especially from Central Asia. Will this have an effect on Russian domestic politics? And if so, what kind of effect uh, mm -hmm. might it have? So sort of climate change and uh, where this might start to change certain equations. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So. Um... Well, the book a bit covers um, dependencies of uh, different um, post-Soviet states economies on the Russian economy. And, and so one area is remittances from workers in Central Asia back home um, from work while well, they're working in, in Russia. So it's interesting, you know, there's, um, there is, I think, a, um, sometimes a misread on, um, Putin's administration that they're, uh, you know, racist and anti-Central Asian. And certainly there's a strain within Russia that where, where that is the case, but there's not um, a, sort of a policy uh, against migrant workers or, the, or even an official view that um, they're unwelcome. Um, there's a concern in different cities, in different markets that's, that sometimes organized crime, you know, develops around food markets. Um, but that's not the only place that organized crime develops, and certainly Central Asian uh, migrant workers are not are, are, are you know not always uh, involved in those. So um, so you know it's not necessarily the, the big wave of migration. Um, and Russia has has actually a net positive migration um, is not destabilizing to Russian politics. It's not. Um, it's not something that has particularly given rise to, you know, far right nationalism. Um, and that has been mostly kept in check. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I think it, it wouldn't be as destabilizing as, as you might be thinking from the, uh, from the question. It might well be welcome because uh, Russia's um, labor force, uh, you know, demographically is, they need, they need immigration to be honest, is uh, their, their labor force is shrinking. Okay, so we get to our, our final two questions. Uh, and uh, let me read them in turn. The first from Eugene Komarov from Voice of America Russian Service. And this is the question is, can you describe the role of Orthodox religious ideology in Russian Orthodox Church uh, as a basis for Putin's aggressive foreign policy? So that's question number one. Um, and I can attest that that theme uh, is in, in, in the book itself. And then the final question from Angie Maldonado. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a good final question. What side are you on uh, when it comes to the debate about Putin's foreign policy? Coherent strategy or opportunistic and incrementalist? So you'll have to come down on, on one side or another in answering the final question and, uh, and uh, also in giving us uh, your sort of closing comments, Catherine. Okay, sure. Uh, so um, I, I can take the second one first, which is mm -hmm. I think it's opportunistic and incremental, um, and there's just a general uh, strategic orientation. Um, uh, it's uh, I think the you know the, the big goal is regime survival. Uh, it's not, uh, and, and there is a there is a you know this is connected. Um, to um, this sort of understanding of the world that uh, Putin and his cronies have. Um, but with every foreign policy move, there seems to be a commercial opportunity a, as well um, for Putin and, and his cronies. So, you know, why is his caterer, as he's called, running um, uh, the Wagner Group? And why is he in Sub-Saharan Africa also helping with, with elections and, and, and um, things like that? So. Um, you know, there, there always seems to be a commercial spin um, and opportunity for um, self-enrichment. So the two things don't, don't have to be, you know, separate, um, I think. Um, and there is also a, uh, 
you know, getting back to some of our earlier conversation, a tendency to fuse the interests of this particular regime with uh, Russian foreign policy. And, and I think if we have a different leadership, we would see that those things are not necessarily fused. Um, in terms of the Orthodox Church and foreign policy, I think it's been used um, as, and what I argue in, in the book is, it's, uh, it's used as um, soft power um, in, in different parts of the world. And in particular, um, you know, with Russian diaspora communities uh, in Europe and in, in North America as well. Um, it trying to sort of remind people of, you know, how great Russian history was and how the church was connected with this and, and Russian grandeur. And um, so it, so I do think that it has, it has sort of been used this way. And if you watch, uh, as I, I'm guessing that the, uh, the person who posed the question has, if you watch some of the um, uh, celebratory um, video um, that was made of Putin um, celebrating his, his 20 or his 20 years of, of public service or 18 years of public service. Um, this um, this uh, video that was shown a few years ago on Russian television, you can find it on YouTube. You'll see Putin being interviewed and it turns out he was secretly baptized in the Soviet era. Um, and um, I, I think, I can't exactly remember the story, but I, but I think the story is that he was baptized by the son or grandson of the current patriarch or, or a grand, a father or grandfather of the current patriarch, something like that. So, you know, uh, it turns out he has this surprising Orthodox um, side as well. And, you know, when his dacha burned down, the one thing he, he got back was this special cross he had, Orthodox cross. So definitely, I think um, in, in it, you know, it, it has been used in a sense to try to mold a narrative of, uh, of, you know, Russian nationalism, Russian history, the Orthodox Church um, definitely wrapped in to this. Um, and there are complaints uh, that the church is now going to be de delegitimized in, in some people's visions, right? And we're seeing some of these protests uh, outside of churches these days um, um, uh, that, it, that it is delegitimizing itself by being sort of absconded this way for, uh, for not, uh, Putin, the regime's purposes. Um, I think that's that, I think I hit them all, Michael, but thank you. It's really interesting conversation and, and hopefully people can um, read the book and react and, and you can find it on various uh, platforms and uh, in Kindle version too. You certainly hit all of the questions and then some. This is the, the book is. In, in physical form, which I can't recommend highly enough. It's just a wonderful uh, contribution, eye-opening, uh, at times provocative, and uh, as I tried to say earlier, very persuasive uh, set of arguments about where Russia is and what the global order uh, looks like at the present moment. So we're very much in your debt for, uh, for, for the book and also for the time that you spent with us um, this afternoon, uh, at least the afternoon in Washington, D.C. So thank mm -hmm. you so much, uh, Catherine, for, for this. Thank and we'll you. look forward to seeing you at the Kennedy Institute in person when that's possible. Let me also thank uh, Shoshana Harris uh, and Victoria Pardini uh, and Morgan Jacobs for all kinds of uh, support for this event, as well as Will Pomerantz and Matt Rodansky um, uh, for their support as well. Uh, for those uh, uh, you know, sort of who have tuned in today, uh, please be aware of uh, other publications and, and podcasts under the rubric of Canon X and the Russia file uh, put out by the Canon Institute, as well as written material analysis uh, and debate uh, under the rubric of Russia file uh, and Focus Ukraine, uh, all sort of easily accessible through the Canon Institute uh, website on December 10th, I can give a date now on December 10th, we'll be hosting Timothy Fry with a sort of very interesting companion volume in by no means identical, but in some respects in dialogue with uh, Professor uh, Stoner's book. And this is Vladimir Putin week, uh, strong man. Uh, so once again, Professor Stoner, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody on this call uh, at later uh, uh, iterations of the, of the long view. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Michael, for everything. Thanks, uh, Victoria and, and the group. And, and uh, thanks, Kennan Institute. And we'll see you soon, I hope. We hope so, too. Yeah, thank you so much.